Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you. This is uh, this is a lot of fun, packed house. Some of it, though, was um, stacking the deck. We got a bunch of cousins here today, so <laughs> thrilled that you guys are here. We also have some terrific, uh, terrific guests who have come from great distance who I treasure. I'm not gonna call any attention to them though, but I'm blo- but I'm blown away. So <laughs> I'm thrilled that all of you are here. We are in the fifth week of a sermon series called the I Am Statements from Jesus. But don't worry, you're not falling behind. Each one does stand alone. But what these seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John, what they comprise together is everything that John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wanted us to know and understand about the God who is man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We've already dealt with several, and there are already some emerging themes. A big theme is that all of these I am statements are a clear, explicit declaration by Jesus Christ himself that he is God. He is the same, I identical in existence to the God of the Hebrew portion of our Bible, whose name revealed to Moses in Exodus 3.14 is, I am that I am. It is a statement that no ethnically Jewish person would just sling about willy-nilly, but on no less than seven, actually more, but seven that we have been examining occasions, Jesus, and in English it just sounds ordinary, I am going to the grocery store, I am going to do this, but it would have landed on their ears very specifically, I am that I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am that I am the light of the world. I am that I am the door to the sheep and the good shepherd which we have already uh, explored, and those are still on Facebook, and they can, be, they can be found elsewhere on the interwebs. Another huge theme, in addition to Jesus declaring his own divinity, which really explains a lot of the consternation, a lot of the frustration of the Pharisees when he would make these statements. On some occasions, they were like, that's it, right? Like, he said the thing, right? We're going to kill this guy, right? Which is shocking. I want us to bear in mind that it is because of his claim to be divine Another thing that each of them bear is a claim of exclusivity, particularly, all of them really, but I think about I am the way, the truth, the life. There's not other ways, there's not other truths that, um, in, uh, cosmically speaking, in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of who is God and the way to reestablish relationship with God the Father, he's the only one, he's the only door through which the sheep enter the safety of the Um, of the flock. He is the only good shepherd where other shepherds have been roundly inadequate throughout time and history. And then today, we explore another I am statement of Jesus in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. I was actually going to share this illustration as my conclusion, but having just sang, uh, Jesus, you are enough, I think I'm going to move it up to my introduction. There was a terrific, fantastic preacher, uh, treasure to the church named Charles Spurgeon. And in one of his sermons, he shared this illustration. Let me jump to the, uh, the page where it's on. I want to read it correctly. Charles Spurgeon said in one of his messages, I heard of some old woman in a cottage. It's an illustration that he was using. I don't know if this is true or if he had come up with it, but I find it very moving. I heard of some old woman in a cottage who had nothing but a piece of bread and a little water. And lifting up her hands, she said a blessing. What? All this and Christ too? I am so gripped by that image. And after we sing that song, Jesus, you are enough. With nothing, I already have everything. In you, I'm created, I'm sustained. If there wasn't one more piece of my physical needs that were satisfied, I already have all that I need in you spiritually. To say nothing of the fact that every good gift that we have at all, family, friends, roof over our head, cool fishing shirt to wear today, right? (laughs) That all of these good gifts also come down from the Father of lights. It says this in James chapter 1, in whom there is no shadow due to change. God is so loving, so lavish is his grace and his kindness and his mercy. That even when I have the impression through my earthly eyes, fleshly eyes, God, this isn't enough to do what I intend. This isn't enough 
for this season. This isn't enough for this or that. I want to remember the truth that the old woman that, uh, that Charles Spurgeon mentioned. No matter what I have, I get all of this in addition to Christ Jesus, who is more than enough. That cuts very close to the heart of our passage today in John chapter 6. Were it possible, we would do the entire chapter, but it is not. So I will be summarizing some portions, reading some. I will even be, it literally makes me sick. I will be omitting some, and I'll tell you when, not for content, okay? <laughs> Only for time. You remember the old, uh, when, a, when a, a movie would come on television? This, uh, this movie has been edited for time and content. I haven't edited it for content. I've edited it for time so that we can both uh, participate in the Lord's table and then get out of here at a reasonable hour. But I implore you, I've been saying this on several of these messages, maybe I'll make this a thing. Please, please, please read John chapter 6 sometime this, sometime this week. Matter of fact, you could listen to it through Bible app or just Google John chapter 6 or YouTube John chapter 6. I bet 100 people have read it already. I looked it up already to be sure exactly what I'm asking you to do. It'll take eight minutes. John chapter 6, which is 1 through 71. 71. You can see why I've edited it, right? But at the beginning of this chapter, we have this setting. Jesus has just fed the, five, the multitude, which includes 5,000 men plus women and children. I think that's an unusual way to take attendance, but it was as good, you know, maybe perhaps in general, men on average are, are um, uh, tall enough to be seen. And we're just going to count these and their women and children. And just, it was 5,000 men. I don't think it's inconceivable that it could have easily been 15,000 people. If there was one lady and one child that, that uh, came along as well. This is an enormous multitude. What did he feed them with? Bread and fish. Five loaves, two fish. This is an astonishing miracle. It, as a matter of fact, other than the creation of the universe from nothing by the will of God, speaking it into existence, and then the resurrection of Christ Jesus, I think it may be the largest in material scope. It is to take what was not nearly enough and make it far more than enough. Do you remember they collect 12 baskets of leftover food at the end of this miracle? This is in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. It is also the only miracle, save for the resurrection, the only miracle performed by Jesus during his earthly ministry, that's recorded in all three Gospels. It's a big deal. It can be found in Matthew 14, 13 through 21, Mark 6, 30 to 44, Luke 9, 10 to 17, as well as at the beginning of John, chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. A crazy thing that is revealed in the other Gospels, though, is the reason that he went out to this place at all was he was trying to get away by himself to spend a little bit of time in prayer to hit a little bit of a reset button because he had just found out that his friend and uh, cousin, John, has been beheaded. John, who had prepared the way of the Lord, who was telling people perpetually during his ministry, Messiah is coming. You need to repent and get ready because the, the, the time is, is so near. John is a wild person within the, within the Bible, the New Testament. Does, has anyone watched uh, The Chosen? I ask this regularly, and I think several of you do. I really appreciate how that actor portrays John. He looks fully insane. <laughs> and the other, God, the other disciples accurately capture his demeanor, particularly the character who plays Peter. He calls him Creepy John, all right? Look, I ate a new bug, right? John cared. John had no concern what the world thought of him, but at all, but that he was preparing the way for Messiah, who he knew, <laughs> perhaps, this, this is what is implied, <laughs> it's a miraculous way, while he was in his, in his mother's womb, that that's Messiah, my cousin, is the, uh, is the anointed one. He gets a little impatient at one moment where he, having been imprisoned, he sends some of his guys to Jesus. He's like, are you the guy or not? I don't think he actually doubted uh, scholars go around. I think it's more like, will you, will you get to getting? I want to see this happen. And he, passed, and he was killed during his ministry. And it hurt Jesus bad. And he tries to get away. And the people follow him out to a desolate place. And rather than say, will y'all get away from me? He says, he, he sees them as sheep without a shepherd, and he ministers to them, and he teaches them. And it went on all day. It is full-on Beatlemania, y'all. Okay? <laughs> okay? This is, he, this is the absolute pinnacle of his earthly popularity. Because in our text, something happens that really 
flips the script. He feeds them. They collect 12 baskets, far more than anyone could have eaten. An astonishing miracle. That's why at church events and potlucks, we always bring way more food that's needed. True story. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He is more than enough. And then he, oh, he's aware these people are about to grab me right now and force me to be their king. And they don't understand that my kingdom is an entirely different plan. It is not of this world. It's also not, it's not time for its instantiation. So he says, uh, fellas, disciples, we came in one boat. There's, there was one boat on the Sea of Galilee at this desolate place. He said, take it, take it away. I'm going to shake some hands at the end of the service. He doesn't say that, but he, he's with them. And he says, just go. I'll see you uh, in Capernaum. And they, of the many times they didn't understand or didn't obey, at least in John, they hop in the boat and they leave him there. They are out at sea, and then the next part of John 6, 16 through 21, is he comes out walking on the water, which freaks them right out. This is an amazing sign miracle within the portion of John that is uh, called the book of signs, these miracles that confirm portions of his message. But then they, he, he climbs in the boat, that's a sermon for another day, and they make it to where they were going, on the Capernaum side of the sea. We are going to pick up into our text now, because we get the I am statement. Understand this, though, that the miracle of the feeding 5,000 is the companion miracle to this statement, as we are about to see. We're very fortunate, unlike some of the other combinations of miracle um, I am statements that are not near one another in Scripture, although I do think there's evidence that healing the man born blind is a companion miracle to confirm his statement that I am the light of the world. These are right next to each other. So I want you to have that context in your mind. Just fed the 5,000, just tried to get away before they could force him to be their king, and we pick up here in verse, I think it's 22. Excellent. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got in the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. I told you, right? This is, this is rock concert. You know, Elvis is doing this stuff and people are falling out. They're all, they, they got to find him, right? They said, he, he left and we didn't notice. There was only, they turned into super sleuths, all right? They, they, their logic becomes, well, there was only one boat. Let's go, let's go get him. I think he's taken that bread and fish act on the road. When they found him, verse 25, on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when'd you, when'd you get here? Oh, we, we were looking for you, man. When, when do you get here? He dials in very quickly that they are not here seeking him as Messiah or his teaching. They are hoping to be hangers-on to the perpetual daily free lunch, which is so beneath his omnipotence. He could do it every day. He could do it every second. He could remake the whole world in bread. That's nothing to him. It isn't why he has come, and they don't understand. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, which also, by the way, wouldn't have been a great reason to be seeking him because in Matthew 12, 39, he answered, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that asks for signs. Oh yeah, man, prove it, prove it, back it up. He comes, he has fulfilled up to that point, every prophecy relevant to his birth, every prophecy relevant to his miraculous healing ministry, and here very soon he will be fulfilling and has been uh, warning them that I will be fulfilling the prophecies of Messiah's suffering, that I will die and return. You remember what he said in um, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I lay it down that I might take it up again. But you guys don't want to hear that. You, you don't even want signs. It would be one thing that I fed the 5,000 yesterday and you were like, whoa, uh, maybe that's the kind of guy we ought to follow. He says, you didn't even come because you saw signs, you, uh, but you come because you ate your fill of the loaves. Meal ticket. I can hardly blame them. I, when I hear there's free something going on someplace, I, I hustle out there. 
but it's frustrating to him because of the clarity of his teaching. He was ministering to them before he fed them with the truth of his word. All the while mourning uh, his cousin whom he loved, his family, and also an important person within God's redemptive story, John the Baptist. He says in 27 to clarify, look guys, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man, which he is referencing a distinctly messianic title from the book of Daniel. He says, that's me, all right? I'm the one who has come, which the Son of Man will give to you. I'll give it to you. Don't be looking for food. That food we made yesterday, we collected up 12 baskets. I hope they brought it to those who would need it. But if it doesn't get eaten soon, it'll perish. And even for those of you who do eat it, it perishes inside of you, and you'll become hungry again. Look for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. There have been days where I have eaten, not eaten, ate. I put food in my mouth and swallowed it. <laughs> Until my stomach was packed. I do it a couple times each summer with crabs, right? The other time I ate by far or I was worried for my health, was um, it was a, while, while I was part of the pastoral team at Sunrise, we would go on these pastor's retreats, and Pastor Daryl, for those of you who may or may not know him, bought these steaks, and after it was div divided up by the number of people who were at this retreat, everyone had a pound and a half. And this will happen when guys get together. You start, I wonder who can finish this thing. And, uh, and I did, and I should not have. <laughs> It would have gone just as well, a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, right? But even on those occasions where I have been so full, I've needed to eat again. He says, guys, you are missing out. You are so zeroed in on the temporal. You are missing the eternal, which I have been trying to deliver to you in message that you might receive it by faith and have it forever. That you might understand what Charles Spur Spurgeon's uh, good lady in the cottage recognizes. All this which is temporal, what a blessing this is, and the eternal Jesus Christ as well. But they didn't get it. 28, they said to him, uh, all right, yeah, um, what must we do to be doing the works of God? All right, man, you got bread that's going to make me not hungry at all. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it. Anybody in here a dog lover? I like dogs. I don't dislike cats. I like them too. So we don't have to go, to, we don't have to come to blows over that, all right? In so much as it is possible with you, live at peace with everyone, all right? That's Romans, I think it's in chapter 12. <laughs> That's a paraphrase. I had a dog. Her name was Kaylee. She was um, part yellow lab and part something else. And that's where a little bit of crazy got in her. But I taught her several tricks as a puppy. And then I, 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 a peculiar thing happened. Whenever I would demonstrate those tricks for people's entertainment, I would do them in the same sequence accidentally. Uh, it was just a habit. Shake with this hand, shake with this hand, roll over. And she would never just regularly roll over. She would do a spin and then roll over. And I didn't like that, but then I started telling her to break dance, and then I liked it a lot. <laughs> so I would shake this hand, shake this hand, roll over, and then I'd tell her to be still, and I'd place a reward on her nose, and she'd have to stay still until I released her. A bizarre thing started to happen. I would, oh, oh, let me show you what my dog can do. And she would do all three of them with no command. She would predict it, right? There was such an urgency for the morsel, and I get that feeling from these, from these people. He's still trying to deliver them something eternal, something timeless, something imperishable. They're like, we'll do, we'll do it, man. What's, what are we talking about? Just, just <laughs> make with the food, right? What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them. This is a wild statement. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. That's already an interesting enough statement. They said, what should we do? Yeah, no. This is the work God does. And your response, it's the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. You guys are just champing at the bit. We ate our fill yesterday, and you don't know what's coming today. And you're like, maybe we could do it every day. It seems like it wasn't that hard for you. That was wild. Let the good times roll. He says, you would never go hungry again. Not, again, we're not talking about your physical bodies, but you would have all that is needed forever if you would believe in the Son of Man, the one whom God has sent. 
believe in me, believe in me, believe in me. John said, it won't be on the screen. I've had it, I've said it every single uh, week during this I am statement. In John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. This is why John wrote this book at all. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. More than healing the man born blind. More than feeding the 5,000. More than healing, healing the man who was lame by the pool at Bethsaida, um, who was trying to get into the bubbling uh, whirlpool. More than... Um, walking on water, more than all of these things. He said he did tons of things. I've written these to you, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I wrote these so that you would believe. He's constantly talking about believe. Jesus wanted you to believe in him. I want you to believe in him. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever, whoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What you have been hungering for in your spirit, even more so than your body, which has an appetite that's cyclical, what you need at the core of your person is him. Believe and partake, and you'll be, you'll be satisfied forever. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he, God, has sent, which is Jesus. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Has anyone here seen the first Disney Pixar Incredibles? That's a fun movie. Early, like in the first act of that movie, while the Parr family, the Incredibles, are still trying to hide their incredible powers, it frustrates the father. And he comes home, and he slips on, I think it's his son's skateboard or something, and he catches himself, but his hand is so strong, he crushes his car's roof, and he can't close the door. And in frustration, he lifts the car, and he's about to spike the car, and a neighbor is on like a tricycle big wheel and sees him, and that's the whole problem. But he just, he just sets the car down and heads home. But then in another scene, still in that first act, while we're having the hero's angst, he gets home, and that kid is sitting at that same spot, right? And he says, what are you doing here? Or he says, what are you looking at? He goes, I, it's something like that. The kid goes, I don't know. I'm waiting for something amazing to happen, I guess. It is an instinct of humanity. If you guys would believe, you'd be satisfied forever to say nothing of the signs I have already done. You're here because of a sign that happened yesterday. I, uh, but what sign do you perform that we could believe you? I, you know, see what I'm saying? <laughs> they say, look, I think give them an example. Here's the kind of sign we'd be looking for, Jesus. I'd be very happy to believe you. Our fathers meaning the nation of, of Israel, the Hebrew people, they ate manna in the wilderness. We notice in a theme, <laughs> they ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. He, God the Father, gave them bread from heaven to eat. That takes place in Exodus 16. That specific quotation is from verse 4. They're like, all right, sign it up, homie, and we'll believe. Do you realize that even the event of manna being provided in the wilderness, which was to sustain their life as well. But that itself was a faith examination test. Do you remember what the instruction was with the manna? Take only as much as you need for one day. Don't take more or it will be putrid and rotten. And folks didn't believe. I don't believe that God the Father will send enough that at the, in the Old Testament before Christ Jesus has, been, has put on flesh. I don't believe that God will send enough. I'm going to take enough for me. And it just stank up the whole house. What's like, don't, don't, I, I, sometimes I'll ask a question and I am looking for an out loud answer. I'm just, ask, just think about it. What's the stinkiest thing you've ever smelled, right? I don't like when potatoes rot. They don't rot often because they could sit in the room temperature. But if you've ever smelt it, whoo, it's bad. I think that about the manna. So then he said, well, wait, don't only, ca only collect as much as you can for one day for uh, five of those days. On the sixth day, what are they supposed to do? Collect a double portion because tomorrow's Sabbath. Don't go out collecting. Um, and they say, no, man. It stank like crazy before. I'm going to take today's and I'll get tomorrow's on Sabbath. They just have to deal. And none came on Sabbath. Well, 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 wait a minute, man. We're hungry. Even the event that these people are referring to, give us a sign, bro. You remember what they did in the, in the wilderness? Was a faith test that at least on its first go-round was failed. 
I'm not, I'm, I'm not coming down too hard on these people. I fail faith tests all the time. Maybe that's an exaggeration, not all the time. But I, who have walked with him for a long time, regularly slip into anxiety and doubt, not about salvation, but about the security of my life when I should be thinking like the woman in the cottage. Whatever I have, this barn, the heater's on, the love of friends and family and brothers and sisters in Christ, loving wife, beautiful kids, I get all this and Jesus they said, show us a sign. Something like uh, when God fed our fathers in the wilderness. Verse 32. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen, for real, for real. <laughs> Which came up in a, uh, a small group discussion one time. I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. I have the advantage of having read this, had it taught to me, having walked with Jesus. So I, I fight the temptation to look down on these folks because, and this is, this is just a, a, a reward a, a, a grace from Christ Jesus that was undeserved. I've never been hungry in a real way. I've been to Guatemala. Uh, Miss Dawn is, was in Guatemala. She's also been to India. Some of you may have been places or seen places. Even, even the images can be gripping enough. There's a, there's a hunger that is real. And I wonder if that's what these people had been experiencing. Or maybe having been fed yesterday, but they know what that is. So a fear about not having enough can eclipse sometimes the message that Jesus is trying to share. But he is trying to explain to them the bread that comes down from heaven is what you should be looking for. It gives life to the world. Well, give, well, give it to us always. Verse 35, this is the first time the I am statement gets said. And it gets said several times throughout chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He expands the metaphor. He says, what you need is me. He is not denying physical needs in order to continue existing so that our heart will continue to pump and all of our bodily functions will continue. There are things that are needed for that. Sustenance, water, air. He's not saying that. He's saying there is a reality that extends beyond this life. There are people out there who have food, have water, have air. It's, you could scarcely say they're alive. They exist. But they are walking around spiritually dead. But if you would partake of the bread of life, which is me, you would have life in that moment and you would have it forever. I am that bread. It has been on my mind more this, more this uh, sermon preparation than in years past that all of this is being taught f only a few days after finding out that he had this huge loss in John, uh, John the Baptist. I don't know why. It doesn't have any impact on the teaching. It just, I want to bear in mind all the time that Christ Jesus, who is fully God, is also fully man. While he is hurting, he is teaching and loving them. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I believe that the original hearers of this I am statement of Jesus, when they hear I am the bread of life, three things would have jumped into their mind immediately. The first and most recent is they would think of the miraculous feed yesterday. It's been the only thing on their mind. They would hear it. Are, you are the bread of life or you have the bread of life? You, your, your grammar has been a little unusual, right? I believe they would be thinking about the miracle of the loaves and fish yesterday. I also think those who are paying attention would be thinking, as they've already pointed out, how God had provided the miraculous bread from heaven, the manna in the desert. That would be on their mind. Because he talks about, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. That image is more evocative of that miracle than what happened yesterday. He had bread, he gave thanks, and it just kept breaking. The bread that comes down from heaven, though, that is a lot like the manna in Exodus and all throughout Numbers as God fed them before they entered the promised land. But then the very strange way that he said, I am the bread of life, 
we pointed it out, the Greek words are ego, amy, but he wouldn't be speaking Greek. This is being recorded in Greek. He would have said, I am that I am the bread of life. And that would have been like, smacked them in the face. That actually would have a disrupting effect on this whole, is there bread here or not, bro? We came all the way across the sea to find you. That would have, that would have altered the atmosphere of this conversation. I am the bread of life. We are going to jump to verse 41, not because there, I actually want to read 36 to 40, but uh, for time. Listen to the whole chapter sometime this week, John chapter 6, but picking up in verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him. Do you remember? I pointed out at least last week, maybe before, John is ethnically Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. All the disciples are Jewish. The entire church was Jewish until persecution struck in Jerusalem, and they spread throughout um, Asia, uh, minor, Europe, North Africa, and we're still a part of that spread here in this part of the world. But So it, it can't mean just ethnically Jewish people. What does John mean when he says, the Jews grumbled about him? Who is he referring to? Pharisees, Jewish leaders. Actually, Pastor Mike had a really interesting point last week that it may be a, com a combination of the Pharisees and possibly the Sadducees because when he was talking about resurrection and the life, that's an infighting between them that perhaps he inspired, inspires that grumbling between them with some regularity. But it's Jewish leadership, Sanhedrin, definitely the Pharisees who are mentioned by name in John in these instances, maybe even more, Jewish leaders. That's what John means by the Jews. It lands odd on English ears, particularly in a more... Um, sensitive culture with regards to, let's be careful what you say. But I just want you to understand, there's nothing anti-Semitic about what John is saying. He is Jewish. So the Pharisees grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. That lands all wrong for them. And they start to grumble. Grumble, 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 grumble. That's what I, that's what I think when, when I think grumble. Jesus, John knew what he was saying when he wrote grumble. Do you remember what brought the manna about in Exodus to begin with? Grumbling. Why'd you bring us out of Egypt, man? Oh, I, uh, <laughs> these messages will go on forever if I'm always stepping backwards. But before that, you guys remember the plagues? Wait a minute, do you remember Joseph? Wait a minute, do you remember the garden, right? Everything has a context, but we'll go back. They are grumbling in the desert. You brought us out here to die. He sent 10 astonishing plagues that their key purpose is to fully embarrass every false god of Egypt. The god with no image trumps all of your gods with golden images. They do nothing. He does everything. This God whom Pharaoh said he's never heard of. After the plagues, they leave. Pharaoh thinks better of it, goes after them. He parts the Red Sea. He has been leading them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night, but they get to a place that's a little sparse, and they say, ah, oh, no. Grumble. And he says, you guys, Moses, I, it always seems to me, although Moses is not flawless either, but in many of these scenes, it's just Moses and, and God, and Moses is like, oh, jeez, these guys, God, these guys, right? And he sends the bread because of their grumbling. He sends the manna. And then later, in Numbers 11, they grumble again. Do you remember what about? I'm really stretching you now. Uh -uh. They grumble about water. In Numbers 11, though, let's stick to the bread. You are right. They grumbled many times. and they, So he's already brought out. The, the feeding and the drinking. They grumble and it relates to the manna. Everybody remember what they grumble about? They want meat. This stuff stinks. You know, manna actually means, what is it? What is this stuff? And they were psyched when it first came. <laughs> Me and dad, we, we share this in common. We, we, we'd, have, we'd have grumbled, bro. There have been times where, <laughs> there, there have been times where I'm eating something and uh, Rachel, who's, who's a terrific cook, and she'll make a bunch of it because she's, She's judicious and thrifty. And in her mind, and she's happy to do this, we'll have it every day for five days. And I'm like, if I eat this one more time, all right, I am going to just grumble. I'm grumbling already. <laughs> my, my, tummy rum, my tummy rumbles or my mouth grumbles, right? They grumble to get the manna. They grumble about the manna. And then John, knowing all of that, remembering this scene, he's 90 years old at least while he's writing this. He was sharp, and the Holy Spirit is inspiring this. He says, uh, the, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, they grumble against him because he said, uh, you're not the bread that came down from heaven. I don't like that. I certainly don't like you saying, I am that I am the bread of life. They grumble. Verse 42. 
<laughs> part of their, grum- their grumbling includes this. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? They think they know Jesus. They do not. Verses like this actually sting me in a certain way because we're about, when, when the I Am Statements uh, series comes to a close, we will enter into an Advent-esque. I actually would, it's probably going to be more about incarnation, what it means that God put on flesh, and that'll lead us up to Christmas. So whenever I read something like this, it, it, it stings me. Mary and Joseph, God's servants, obedient, both, not that they're flawed, they have sins, they need to be saved by grace through faith just as much as anybody, but they were terrific heroes in God's plan. And it was thought even to this day, while Jesus is a 30 plus year old grown man, we know your mom and dad. We know the scenario and the, and, the, and the story that they spun. We'd have killed your mom, except that your dad didn't want to do it, which proves that it was just him and her that made you out of time. Isn't, isn't that who this is? It, it grates me. I want to yell and fight these people. <clears throat> do you remember a scene I've altered my intro today because I wanted to move the woman in the cottage up further, but this is what the intro would have been, and it'll fit just fine here. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 20, it is a section of the Bible that is sometimes called the Great Confession. I love the book of Matthew. We get the Great Commission. We get the Great Commandments, and we also get the Great Confession. Jesus asked his disciples, out of curiosity, hey, guys, who do people say that I am? We've been at this for a little while, and they give him a bunch of unusual answers. Uh, some people say that you are Elijah, the prophet, come again. There is some, <laughs> there is some reason for them to think that. At some point in the, uh, in the Passover, this, uh, the seat is left open for Elijah, right, in practice. God didn't tell, tell them to do that, but they're expecting an Elijah-like person to return, but possibly Elijah himself. I also think there may be some merit to that in the eschaton in the end. Anyway, they say that's one idea. Some people say you're one of the prophets. Maybe you're the prophet greater than Moses, who we have been expecting, which he is, but that's sort of insufficient. That's still not exactly capturing it all. Some people say you're John the Baptist come back, which is really weird because they lived at the same time and they were friends and cousins and bros, right? So that's a weird one. People are doofuses. He says, okay. <laughs> he says, he says, that was interesting. Uh, Who do you say that I am? And Peter, in verse 16, so that's uh, Matthew 16, 13 to 20, 16 is where Peter says this. Simon Peter answered, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus also goes on to say, "Uh, good job, but you didn't come up with that yourself. (laughs) It It is my father in heaven. Actually, that's not dissimilar. How do, we do the, how do we do the works of God to receive this bread of life? He says, it's not you. The work of God is that you believe. I think about that, and we are getting to, this, to, this, to the crux of this. They thought they knew who he was, and they did not. My fear is that in churches all over the country, the world today, are filled with people who think they know who he is, and they don't. They do not know the light of the world the way, the truth, and the life, the bread of life, the one door to the sheep, the good shepherd. They don't know. Jesus says that I am the bread of life. He is describing himself. I'm sorry, could you go one more? I I must have had these out of order. Thank you. When Jesus says that I am the bread of life, he is saying that he is the great I am. And he describes himself as bread Because he's saying that he is essential, necessary for life. Not just physical life, which that can be sustained for a time with just enough food and water and a few other protective things. He says, I am essential for eternal life. For life everlasting. For abundant life. All other things that we describe as life, at least among humanity, is actually walking death. But you could be made alive in Christ If we believe into him, elsewhere he describes, uh, I'm actually going to read it. I'll read a little bit of it anyway. This won't be up there. I'm going to read quickly. Jesus answered them after their grumbling, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. He's saying, that's me right now. I've been teaching you, trying to anyway. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. That's me, he says. He, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes, whoever believes has eternal life. Back to verse 48. I am the bread of life. That's the whole verse. With all of this explanation and preamble, I am the bread of life. You, actually, we are going to read a little bit of it as part of our communion ceremony. He goes on to explain them. What do you guys got? I'll ask you. You can read it later, but even just logically right now, what do you got to do with bread for it to take its effect? You got to eat it. It's an unusual metaphor. God has said a lot of strange things, and he's actually made some people eat some unusual things. He made John, during his vision that brings about the book, Revelation, he made him eat a scroll. He said it was sweet in his mouth and sour in his stomach. That's, I'm, just, I'm only bringing that up as an example. Let's not go into that. But um, as there have been some unusual things that people have had to eat in service to the Lord. Moses broke the golden calf, pounded it into dust, put it in the water, and made the people drink it. Which is gross. There are other things he said you cannot eat. One of them explicitly is flesh with blood in it. He says, you need to eat my flesh, and you need to drink my blood, or you have no part in me. If anyone in here doesn't have a ton of familiarity with the church, the doors are right. No. <laughs> he said this thing. In John chapter 6, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, or I'm, uh, I'm summarizing to the end. Please read it. People, not the, not the Jewish leaders who already weren't with him, people who had made the trip across the sea heard that, and they said, yes! And they left. And he turns to his disciples, and he says, uh, what about you guys? You guys going to leave too? And their answer isn't like, oh, no, we get it. That this is a description, an, an evocative and vivid description of what it means to partake of you in faith. We also understand that your body will be broken for our sins, and that is, how your, that is how your flesh is sacrificed. And for us to partake of it is an act of faith to give up what we were doing, to give up what was sustaining our life, our physical food, and to consume your spiritual food by faith and to have eternal life in you. They didn't understand any of that, but you know what they did say? Where are we going to go? You have the words of life. What you've, what you've said is, is unusual and difficult, and I hope that it's unusual to this day. I went back and forth as to whether or not to share that at all. I was like, what if we have some guests? But then I thought, Jesus said it, and it explicitly drove people away. When he turned to his disciples, he said, I'm not looking for Beatlemania. He didn't say that. That's the implication. <laughs> they said, what? <laughs> He's talking in tongues. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm not looking for, for popularity. He says, I fed these people so that they would understand a spiritual reality about me. I am the bread of life. I am necessary. I am as, as essential as sustenance is for physical life. Unless you partake of me by faith, there's no, there's no life. And when, when physical death comes, if you've not received spiritual life by faith, then the second death comes and we'll be separated from the Father forever. Oh, that you would choose life and believe in his name. It's so crazy to me that both the feeding of the crowd and the manna in the wilderness were intended to point to a greater reality, which is Jesus. Jesus tells them not to long for physical bread. Even if that bread is, even if that bread is provided by God himself, don't long for that. It isn't just the manna. It's not even the bread that I've divided myself. Don't long for that. He says that you should be looking for the living bread. Jesus, the bread of life who has come down from heaven. Jesus. This bread is Jesus himself. And for those of us who have placed our faith in him, you have partaken. And then we have a ceremony, which we are about to observe, where we remember it with some frequency. Here we partake monthly. I hope that that is a... Uh, I hope that's all right with you guys. Some churches do it far more often. I've been to some churches that do it far less. So we, we're, we've settled in at about a month and more often as needed. And you can participate in the Lord's table by yourselves, by the way, in community. It's a celebration that's meant to be done in community, but it doesn't have to be done here. I've also done that as well. 
But this is a ceremony and a symbol for those who have already accepted the bread of life by faith. If you have not done that yet, you can right now. You can, strange as this phrase is, eat the bread of life by believing that he is the bread of life, that Jesus is God who became a man, came to earth and lived a perfect life on your behalf and on my behalf, so that at the appointed time he could offer himself as a sacrifice in death on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, that for those of us who confess our sins and believe in him, we can receive that eternal life. 